God commends us, turn then and live. Verses 1, 3, 5, and 6 of him 448. 1, 3, 5, and 6. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure. This through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Today's first reading is from the prophet Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The, ch the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. 
Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life, because they considered and turned away from all the transgressions that they had committed. They shall surely live. They shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you, according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions. Otherwise, iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. The word of the Lord. Let us read in unison Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be humiliated, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Let the treacherous be disappointed in their schemes. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. In you have I trusted all the day long. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love, for they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transactions. Remember me according to your love. And for the sake of your goodness, O Lord, gracious and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches sinners in his way. He guides the humble in doing right and teaches his way to the lowly. The second reading today is from Philippians. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of the Lord. Hymn 458, verses 1 to 5 and 7.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go to work in the vineyard today. But he answered, I will not. Still, later on, he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your mind and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So as always, we have some really great stuff going on today, because we've, we've got this, not only this promise of freedom, true freedom, but, but if that was it, that'd be enough, right? But that's not just it, because we also have been given the method to achieve it. What is it to just give somebody a tool if they don't know what to do with it, but to tell them, to show them, to invite them, to accompany them along the way, to mentor them. This is the gift that God gives us every day and today in Scripture. And this is extremely, extremely good news. We're going to start with Ezekiel. You all have heard me talk about Ezekiel before, right? He lived during the time of the Babylonian captivity. So Babylon had came down and conquered Israel, conquered Judah, and carted away all the cream of the crop. And what I mean by that is that they were very smart. They said, okay, I'm going to conquer these people, but instead of killing everybody, we're going to, we're going to take some away. We, we take away the doctors and the lawyers and the poets and the painters and the architects and all the people who could do stuff. And they took them back to Babylon and they gave them houses and they gave them stuff to do. They left the other people there, you know, ditch diggers and stuff that weren't skilled labor. This was brilliant because it added to the, the learning and the ability of Babylon. And while people lived there, and the Jews were no exception to this rule, because they were given wonderful stuff, they lived in a nice house and they were giving things to do. If I was an architect, I could build something. If I was a painter, I had paints. That many of them grew to like it. I mean, they were there over 70 years. The whole generation grew up there, maybe two. So some liked it there and thought this is fine. And they followed their faith, but, you know, how that goes. You're busy painting, and, you know, what can you do? There were others still that were there that did what they did, but they didn't like it there, and they complained about it. They were captives, nonetheless, even if it was nice. That's that gilded cage thing, right? The problem was that how they complained. See, Ezekiel was that prophet that God spoke to them about how they complained or how they, they responded to being captives. Now, you might imagine that Ezekiel was not a popular guy because you have a whole bunch of people who are already captives and then you've got Ezekiel speaking for God and he's saying stuff like, you're doing it wrong, you're not saying the right thing, you've got the wrong attitude and you're all going to go to hell if you don't stop it. So, not, not a popular guy, yet still called by God, so he did it. And that's where we pick him up here today. He is, God is responding through, through, through Ezekiel to the people and it begins with this. He said, why do, what do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Well, what does that mean? Well, this is a direct reference to Exodus 34, 7. 
And we all know Exodus 34, 7. If you don't know it, you know it. Because this is the passage where it says that the sins of the father are visited on the third or fourth generation. And this is befuddling to so many people. Because oftentimes, and completely incorrectly as we know, in, in history, this is taken to say that what the mom or dad did wrong, God punishes the children and the children's children and the children's children. In fact, this is what Israel thought, isn't it? When you saw a beggar or somebody who was crippled or a blind person that was begging outside of the, outside of the city, they were not just somebody who's in a poor state and can't work. They were believed to be corrupted because either they, if they had been injured during their lifetime, or if they were born the way they are, blind or crippled, their parents were sinful. And because of the parent's sin, the mother or father, God afflicted the child. And the child is then living out the parent's sin. What a horrible, horrible way to understand this. Completely wrong understanding, incorrupted understanding of, of this in Exodus 34. What does it mean? What does it mean that when you sin, the, the sins of the father are visited on the third or fourth generation? Well, it's simply this. I, I'm a father. And I, I have my own will, and I have my own purpose, and I have my own attention. I don't really don't listen to anybody. I just listen to myself because it's my life. It's my thing, and I do my thing, and I have the way I want it, and I'm going to do this. And this is just wrong. But I like it. And I got a son. And I want my son to like me. I want my son to be like me. So I'm going to teach my son to do this too. And he does because he wants to be like dad. And then he grows up, and he teaches his son. So that the thing that I started, the corruption that began in me, I have passed on to my son and my son's son and my son's son's son. And it could keep on going until some outward influence comes in to break the cycle. We see this so many places. Domestic violence is one of them. Domestic violence is often inherited as an action from father to son. There are other ones. There are ones that probably many of us are aware of. How about the Hatfields and the McCoys? Anybody remember the Hatfields and the McCoys? There were movies about the Hatfields and McCoys way back in the day. I think Gary Cooper was in one of them. Anybody remember him? I can remember watching those movies. You know, whatever happened to the Hatfields and McCoys? Do you, do you know they're still there? They, they, lived, they lived on the, on the border of Kentucky and West Virginia. Right? The Hatfields and in uh, West Virginia and the, and the McCoys in Kentucky. And you know what started that feud that, that took the lives of so many people? No one knows. There's a supposition that it happened because a member of the Hatfield clan stole a McCoy pig, and that set it off. There's another opinion that it could have been that the Hatfields were, in the, were Union sympathizers and the McCoys were Confederate sympathizers, and it was after the war, and you know... They didn't get along, so that's where it went. They don't know. Today, they don't know. What we do know is that whatever the spark was that lit this off caused the life change of so many people, took the life of different people. Husbands, fathers, sons, even women were killed. So what are they doing about it today? They were at it for over 40, about 40 years. Generation, two generations of kids raised up. Think about it. I'm, I'm a 40-year-old father, and I got a 17-year-old son, and I'm, this thing's starting. The clan's at war. I'm going to get my son in there. He's going to be helping out, and I got a 14-year-old boy behind him, and you know he's not going to stay at home. He's going to learn this stuff, and the daughters too, and the wives. Everybody's going to be involved in this thing, and we're all going to hate those people because they are worth hating because they are so corrupt they're going to ruin the entire world. That could only happen back in those days, right? Couldn't have that kind of a thing happen now. You know what stopped it? Love. A Hatfield boy fell in love with a McCoy girl. And those two decided that they weren't going to let their fathers or their father's fathers tell them they didn't love. And they weren't going to let them say that their love was not real love. And they weren't going to let them tell them that the love that they had for the other made that that person wasn't worth their love. And so they stayed in love and they got married. And the feud ended. Don't know why it started, knew what the price was, and ended by love. Love, love fixed it. Love broke the cycle that would have kept on going and kept on going and kept on going. And today, well, a number of Hatfields have married McCoys. 
And in fact, they, they, they know each other. They have lunches and picnics, and, and they were running a tourist thing, Hatfields and McCoys together, because people used to go and, and see where the Hatfields and McCoys lived. All because of love. Love made the difference. Love got the change. In this, in this, the child, in this system here, the child in Israel, the Babylonian kids, the, the adults are saying, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's mom's fault. It's dad's fault. I wasn't even alive back then. I was born here. I've been living here 50 years. Why did I get here? How am I here? I'm not happy. I am happy, but I'm far away. You know what? I don't know my religion anymore. I can't practice it, but that's mom's fault. And God goes on to say, no, no, you are capable of of amending your life. You are capable of doing things different. You are capable of changing who you are if you want to. Now, maybe you are in captivity. Maybe you can't go anywhere. Maybe you're stuck right there. But the way that you look at your life, the way that you look at your family, the way that you look at the world, the way that you look at me will change everything. And you can do it. You you can change the way you look at things. Because I'm here to help. Well, you could do it on your own, but I'm still here to help. We can still do that, you and I. We can change everything. Everybody go to Studley's store? Does anyone know where that is? Go up, go up uh, Studley Road, and if, there's, a, there's a post office, and if you're going too fast, you'll go right past Studley's store. Well, I was in there, stopped off, this is probably 10 years ago now, and I was getting, in, there's one table, there was one, one little table in Studley's store you could sit down and eat, and he makes like sandwiches, like, like uh, peanut butter jelly and ham sandwiches and stuff like that, you could buy hard boiled eggs, so I went in and got something, and I'm sitting there, and, and he started talking to me. This guy was a, uh, a, a, a tech guy in, in uh, Silicon Valley. This was back when the tech bubble burst, that's however long ago that was. And he was losing his job, and so he found out. Someone told him, he said, in Virginia, they've got a new thing called the Technology Corridor. And they've got so many jobs, they don't know what to do with them. So he got on a plane, and he flew out to Virginia. You know, that's, that's um, the Technology Corridor is, is the Dulles Airport access road, going from, from uh, 495 into Dulles Airport. So he flew all the way there, and he went to business, to business, to business, to business. And guess what? No jobs. So... He left that area and he started going around. He went to parts of Virginia or parts of Maryland, down to Virginia, to Crystal City, and then he started coming south. He came all the way down here. It took him two months, about two months, to do all this stuff. Renting a car, went to to uh, Richmond, tried to find a place in Richmond. Nobody, nothing. So in despair, he started to drive. He got in his car and he just drove. It was too many times, too many, too many no's, and he just drove. And he found himself driving and driving. He he drove out. Studley Road. He didn't know where he was. He was just driving. And then he pulled up on this store and he got out and went inside. And if you know Studley's store, it's a house. It's, it's, a, it's a house. <laughs> he went in Studley's store and he met this guy and he got a pop or something and sat down at a little round table. And the guy behind the counter over here is like, hey, you know, how you doing? Where you been? What's going on? You know? And so the guy told him a story. And the man listening to him said, oh, well. <laughs> If you want to buy a store, I'm retiring. Guy got up, said, hang on, went to the phone, called his wife, said, sell everything. Sell the house, sell everything but the kids. <laughs> everything. Get the money, get on a plane, and get out of here. I'm buying a store. She flew out here. He bought the store. He lived upstairs until they got a house, and they moved in the house. Changed everything. I was with somebody a little while ago who asked who had an issue, and he told me that really upset because he has, he can't, he, I said, well, after this issue, I said, you, why don't you just leave? You got family in other places, you can go someplace else, why don't you move? I can't move. Why? Oh, I, I, know, I know these people here. I'm like, are those the same people that you just said <laughs> are the ones that are driving you crazy that you can't stand? Are you staying here for them? We have to make our own misery, don't we? Not only make our own misery, but live within the context of it. It's the tyranny of perspective and fear. I don't want to change the way I see the world, but I'm afraid to leave. So we're burdened by this. And you know, oftentimes what this breeds in us is 
let's call them shifting sands. I, lack of responsibility. It's not my fault. It's his fault. It's her fault. It's their fault. It's where I live. That's the problem that I can't leave. God's saying, no. No, you can't do that. That's not the way it works. That's not the way I made you. Now I'm here to tell you, you can be free. In fact, God goes on. He says, why will you die? Remember, this is for the living. God's talking about the living here. So what is God saying? Why will you die? Like, you're going to drop dead because, you know, you don't leave? No. He's saying, your life, your life that you're living right now is made to live. You're made to live. You're made to have life and have it abundantly, Jesus says. You're, you're made to find joy and peace and believe. You're, you're made to see things, the majesty of things, and live into the awesomeness of God's creation. Why would you die to that? Why would you live a dead life, taking no pleasure and seeing no wonder? Why? And then, of course, there's always the final end. For if you don't know me, you're truly dead. I take no pleasure in this. So he says, turn. Turn then from this and live. Turn and live now and forever. We think that this is the only time, of course, we see in the biblical record that it never is. This is never a one-shot deal. In fact, it happens over and over and over again. And that's a blessing to us. These poor people in history have done these things are a blessing, even in, in the mistakes and, and the shortness of their sight for us, because we can see them and relating to them, we have a chance to turn and live. And nobody's immune. When Jesus was walking around doing his thing, he confronted Sadducees and Pharisees and temple uh, uh, authorities all the time. I have to tell you that right before this gospel that we have today, big things just happened. Jesus just rode into town on a donkey. That's Pentecost. People threw down their, their clothes and palm branches and they cried out because they knew who he was by what he had done. And they cried out. They said, they said Hosanna in the highest. Son of David, Messiah. And then he got done with that donkey ride and he went into the temple. And in the temple he started knocking over everything, knocking over the chairs, knocking over the tables, and kicking people out and saying, get out of here, this is not a place for usury. You don't come in here and cheat people. This is a place where people find me, find my father. This is a place where everything changes or has the ability to change in their life. This is a place where they can get rid of themselves and take on the newness of life. Uh, and then he left. Of course, the temple priests watched him do all this. And they had a little meeting and they said, we got to get this guy. we got to get this guy. Look what he's doing. So he left, he went outside, and when he was outside, he healed all kinds of people. People were coming to him from all over the place, bringing the, the crippled and the blind and, and the deaf, and he was healing everybody. And while he was doing this, they were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, son of David, Messiah. This is, this is the Messiah. There, nobody can do this but him. This wasn't a secret. This truth he brought with him from where he came. That's why when he came, they threw everything down. He didn't get there to do a miracle, and then they threw it down. He, before he came into town, they knew who he was. Everybody knew. And then he goes back into the temple. And when he gets back in the temple, it's where we are today. It says, Jesus entered the temple. The chief priests and elders of the people came as he was teaching, and they said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you that authority? They know. Everybody knew. You couldn't do these things, right? You couldn't heal people and raise the dead unless God gave you the ability. They know where the authority came from. The problem was that they were in themselves, under the tyranny of the self. They were more concerned with their robes and with their, with their authority and with the order that they got and the augustness of their position. And they saw Jesus. Gosh, could it be that God is here? doesn't really matter. They saw him as trying to steal the limelight from them. Their question is dishonest. And so Jesus didn't answer. He says, okay, I got a question for you. I'll ask you one question. You answer the one question, I'll tell you where the authority came from. Of course, it would be easy to tell them. Anybody could tell them. I, I secretly wonder if somebody in the back wasn't going, he's the Messiah. What's wrong with you? And Jesus asked this question about John. And we hear the answer, don't we? And the answer is exactly what we'd expect from these people. 
They didn't care if he was the Messiah. They didn't care if John was called by God. They didn't care if God was involved in any aspect of their own life. God is an inconvenience when I want something. And so they came back and said, oh, we don't know. It's not going to trap me in this one. For me to answer accurately means I have to change. I have to accept the reality of God's love. I have to accept the reality of an ability to change. I have to accept that I'm not God. And Jesus says, well, how about this one? You can't answer honestly with the truth. So let me give you a little parable. We have the two guys, right? You ask them, and who was the winner? The number one guy. They were quick to answer. Got it. And Jesus came right back at him again, and you know why? Because they're the number two guy. They identified the right guy from being the wrong guy. They're the ones who said, I will follow God. I will do what God said. I will, I will tell you. I will show you. I will be with you. And then they don't do it. How many people today don't do this? How many clergy don't do this? How many clergy out there are not teaching God? They're teaching social things and this and that and the other thing, but they're not teaching the service of Scripture. They're not teaching the way of Christ. They're not teaching a depth of relationship through the Holy Spirit. Why? You know, after we have the gospel lessons, we have Paul comes along. We always have Paul coming along. It's a second lesson, but it's the later lesson. Paul is writing in response to the reality of God, a commentary, if you will, on a lot of what Jesus is saying. And certainly, Paul is well known and knows well what God is saying through Christ. He, he, remember last week, he said, I live in Christ, but, but to die would be better? Because to die would be to go to Christ? I don't have any fear of dying. I live in Christ now. My life is in Christ now. Paul, in here, is in prison. He's in Rome. He's under house arrest. He doesn't have anything. Remember, he rode away. He asked people to send him a, 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 a blanket because he was cold at night. They asked him to send him some money because he couldn't eat, because he had to pay for his own food, even though he was under arrest. And yet, even in there, although he does have a slip now and then, says, man, I'm really tired. No credit, I shouldn't say that. And he goes back and he says, you know what? I know who Jesus Christ is. I live in Jesus Christ. And even though these terrible things are happening, I'm okay. I'm okay, and I'm going to be okay. That's just a done deal. I may be a little uncomfortable right now, but that's okay. Because even being uncomfortable, I can witness to the person of Jesus Christ. I can witness to the life, death, and resurrection of him who can free us, free me from the tyranny of self and set me on a path of life. And so he's talking here. He says, he says in response to the Philippians, because the Philippians who, were, who had written to him and sent him money in response to that need, they had a problem in Philippi. He got the word. He said, they said, okay, we got some guys here. We got, we got some clergy over here. We got some clergy over here. The clergy over here, these, these two, three guys, they're just doing it to get rich. They're just doing it to be notables. They want to be like somebody. They're doing a good job. They're preaching. Their preaching is good. But, but they're, they're not doing it for the right reason. Well, you got all the guys over here. They're, they're doing it for the right reason. They're doing it because they love you. They love God. And, and that's why they're preaching. And they, you know, they're not in it for the money. And Paul writes back and he says, wait, they're not corrupt. They're preaching the right thing. Okay, let them go. Let them preach. Because if they're preaching and people are hearing, maybe people will change. Maybe people will be saved. Maybe people will know. And maybe, just maybe, I, I told you about this for myself, right? Just maybe, I, I told you I was the first one to hear my sermon whenever I preach it. I get to hear it first as it's coming out of my mouth. Sometimes it's really distracting, let me tell you. It hits home. These guys over here, he said, maybe they'll hear their own sermon and they'll change. Don't stop them. Unless they become corrupt, then stop them. But right now, don't stop them. Then he goes on. He says, do nothing, because now he's talking about their relationship. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus, in, just in the Matthew Gospel of Matthew, a little while earlier, he said, uh, you've heard it said, love your Love those who love you. I'm telling you, anybody can do that. Love your enemies and pray for them. Not just the people that love you. Love your enemies. Paul says, having the same love, being in full accord and in one mind. What mind? Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourself. This is a big one, isn't it? Better than myself? 
That means serving. That means I serve the other person. If I regard this other person as a person that is greater than I, then I serve them. That's the call that I have to serve. Who do we emulate that did that? <laughs> ultimate service, ultimate gifting. The, the purpose that Jesus came in, in part and to a large part was to show us how to share, how to serve, and how to love. To say, I will lay down my life for the other because I love them. Now, Jesus did say, you can't, you can't do that. You, you just haven't got it in you. you you're not capable. That's why I'm here. So you can come to me. You can love through me. My love in you will make it possible for you to love in me and serve. So Paul says it. He says, love one another and love the other as they are better than you. Because if they are, then you can serve them. And he goes on, he says, let each of you look to your, don't let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you. Here's that same mind. I said, what mind? Let the same mind be in you that's in Christ Jesus. Take on Christ's mind, Christ's heart, Christ's love, and become something new. If we live in this small tyranny of self, then our life is defined by our interests or by the things that please us or tickle our fancy or, or excite us or whatever. And then when I live in that place, I am always going to be dissatisfied with what I know or don't know or what's going on. And we see this in the lives of so many people around us right now. You know, the, the big, the big um, pinata right now, right, is politics at, at all. Get involved in politics, no matter what politics you're involved. doesn't matter. I'm not saying that. I'm saying if you get involved in that and that defines your life, then you're never satisfied. You can't be. Someone's always going to lose. Someone's always going to say something you don't like. It's just going to be that way. And when we live our life in dissatisfaction, we are caught with, under the tyranny of self. Not truly living, not in Christ. even unto death on a cross. Therefore, my beloved, work out your own salvation. What is that? Can I save myself? Yes. I have to work it out, though. Marion's right. Jesus saves me, but I have to work it out. If I don't live into the person of Christ, if I don't live into the love of God, if I don't live into the opportunity to grow and become the person God intended me to be, then I will stay the one that I am. Living into the tyranny of myself, my own perspective, my own pejorative understanding of the world, or, or my own suffering. How sometimes we get caught in the process of living and liking the way we suffer. It defines us. To work out my own salvation is to realize these things about me and give myself over to Christ so that Christ's love can be my love and my love can find fruition in his love. And I can be the servant that I'm called to be by his example. And then in this life, today, everything becomes new. Freedom, free, be free, turn, and live. Amen. Please stand with me. Together we will say the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. 
For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people can be found in your bulletin. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. We pray especially for those members of our parish family and extended family who are on our prayer list. We pray for those who are traveling this week or weekend. We pray for their safety. We pray for those whom we care about who are far from us. Lord, we ask you to keep them safe and to bring us peace. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's peace be with you. <laughs> I'm going to be rubber man. Let's peace with you. Let's peace be with you, sister. Thank you so much. Oh, doing a little dance up here. Good morning. How are, I hope everybody is well this beautiful fall day. What a joy it was this morning as the sun came up and a cool breeze was blowing. Uh, we have a whole lot of announcements here in the bulletin, so I'm just going to go through a couple of them for you and with you. Of course, Wednesday night we are doing the screw tape letters. We began last Wednesday night. We're doing that. We'll let you listen to the, um, the audio of the screw tape letters. There may be another uh, video clip that I have for everybody, and then we uh, talk about the, the book. If you haven't done the screw tape letters or been part of that, 
it's an exciting thing, just like scripture. It will have you look at your life and the way that you think of the world in a completely different way, or maybe the same way, but in a, in a different, uh, different setting. So if you want to come and join us, that would be fantastic. Um, we, we meet at 7 o'clock, and we'll, we get going there about 7.30, and we take it all. So if you can't come at 7, this goes for Bible study too, the time for us to get together and, and, and share uh, our needs, our fun, whatever it is. Uh, come at 7.30, and that's when we kick off both the Bible study at 7.30 and Screw Tape Letters at 7.30. So you are cordially invited. Stew sale. Best stew in Mechanicsville, remember that. Or Hanover. Or Virginia. Or the, or the world. So just make sure you keep telling everybody and letting them know that 550 quarts can't be a secret, right? That's, that tells us something right there. Not even near the, the date, and they're already being sold. So uh, pass that on. And here's the next one. This is for everybody, and everybody's everybody who knows everybody about doing everything that's going to sign up on that list. Sign up soon. Sign up on the list where you can and soon so that Catherine can go to sleep. Because if that list stays unpopulated, she is not going to be able to sleep. She's going to get that vein that stands out right here and all like that. So let's, take, let's, let's be really kind to our sister and sign up on that list so that she can be at peace with this. Uh, that's a first. Okay, so we got adult form. Oh, adult form, we started today, 9.30. It goes 9.30 to 10.15. We're doing a short course in Christianity. Today we started out with prehistory. That is God before the Bible. That's back there when there, nobody was writing. But what we know about God, we find in the Bible. And that sets the tone and tenor for everything that comes after it. But you missed that one. So you'll have to come to the next one. We're getting started in, uh, in Genesis. And what we're going to do is go through the, the biblical witness, the historic witness, the architectural witness, the polity process, all the way up to who we are today. The good and the ugly. So come and join us 930 at 1015. And prayer list and MSEF and volunteers. Uh, one, I was asked to make this announcement for everybody. Remember, if you are not receiving Creator Calling on Tuesday or the other uh, emails that are coming out of the church office, please call uh, Mary and make sure that you're on the list. Of course, if you received them before, you are, but for some reason, electronically, people now and then just glitch off. So please call. I also I uh, was asked to tell you that I've done a couple series. My last series, I think, was on prayer, or the one before that was on prayer. I'm doing one on, on uh, Christian mysticism right now. So if you, you hear that word and you start thinking about um, uh, crystals and candles and all that stuff, let that go. That's not it. This is Christian mysticism. It's been around as, almost as long, maybe as long as the church. Uh, it's well seated and a part of who we are as Christians and how we relate to God. And here's the kicker, guys. You can be part of it, too. The only reason why it's such an oddball thing is because nobody's been talking about it for a long, long time. So if you want to catch up on what I've already written, you can go to, to Creator, uh, our website, and then look back underneath my letters. They're all there, and the next one comes out next Tuesday. All right, other announcements? Will? Oh, that was it? Others? Birthdays. Anniversaries. I guess we got them all last week, wasn't it? Uh, I will say that uh, a reminder about communion. So we take communion in, you can take communion in one kind or in two kinds. That's up to you, your, your polity, your spirituality is how you, how you relate. Uh, we have the common cup, 
and the wafer. So the way that this is going to work is if you want just to take the wafer and no wine, then just put your hands out like this, and I'll give you the wafer, and then the chalice bearer will come along and you just kind of close up, and the chalice bearer will go right on by. If you want to take the wafer and the wine, you take the wafer and you eat the wafer. You eat the wafer. And then the chalice comes and you drink out of the chalice. If you want to take the wafer, but you don't want to drink out of the chalice, you want to intinct, then when you ask me for, when and I come to you, instead of being like this, go like this, like you're holding a wafer in your fingers. And I have a special cup, and so I will take the wafer and I will intinct it for you and then hand it to you. So it's not going to be, the intinction is not coming out of the other, the big cup. It's coming out of the little cup. Same wine, both consecrated wine. It's just coming out of the little one instead of the big one. Okay? If you mess up, <laughs> if you goof somehow and it gets passed, or you drop the wafer, okay? It's no big deal. The, the chalice bearer will tell me, and I will come around, and I will take the wafer away, and I will give you a new one. We'll fix it. Uh, don't leave the altar rail without taking communion. That's why you come up to commune with the Lord through this sacrament. So if it's a boo-boo, it's okay. You just stay, and we fix it, and then you go on, okay? All right. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that we might turn and live. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. 
It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source and light of life. You made us in your image and call us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by the power of your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died, lived, and rose for you. And feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Amen. The blood of Christ. 
us the cup of salvation. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is given for you. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. of Christ, the bread of heaven. 
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your heart and your mind in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit.
Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.